The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Okay, so now actually we're supposed to be doing some meditation. So my program says... Okay. Here we go. So, everybody's sitting down. If you feel hot, imagine what it must be like for the monks in the jungles of Thailand or Sri Lanka. If it's too cold, imagine what it must be like for the monks in Tibet <laughs> meditating in the snow fields. In other words, you can never get perfect, it's good enough. So, close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, you can be much more sensitive to your body. A huge distraction, the distraction of seeing, is put aside. Now you can be with your body. And as you're with your body, you can check how it is sitting. What is your posture now? Don't ever think there is a right posture and a wrong posture. Because your most comfortable position will change day to day, hour to hour. So you're more concerned with what's comfortable right now. And this afternoon, in uh, Darling Road, East Morven, Melbourne, Australia, planet Earth, solar system, Milky Way galaxy. How are you? Then once you have a reasonable posture, check it more meticulously, more carefully. How are your legs now? To arouse mindfulness of your legs, ask your legs, how do you feel? As if your legs were a different person being. Like you ask me, Ajahn Bam, how are you? Now you're asking your legs, legs, how are you? Straight away, your mindfulness awareness goes to that part of your body. And you can move those legs. You can adjust them. As you adjust them, you ask your legs, is that better? Your mindfulness is giving you feedback. So you can understand what is the best position for your legs right now. And then, when you are confident you got your legs in the best position, then you go to your butt, your buttocks. Because many people fidget when they're on a chair or on a cushion. Because they don't get their buttocks in a good position to begin with. So I'm aware and kind. And then I go to my back, making sure my back feels good. And I change it every now and again. Sometimes I slump. Sometimes I straighten the back. You find what's most comfortable for you. Understanding that you need to maintain this position for 30 minutes. And endurance just makes you tense. We don't use willpower, we use wisdom power. And go. 
kindness. And you check your shoulders to learn how to relax them. How do you know you're relaxing? Mindfulness allows you to see how the feelings in your shoulders change. And soon you learn how to let go enough so the tightness in your muscles, in the shoulders, you can actually feel them, experiencing them, loosening. This is how we learn how to let go, starting with our body. If your shoulders get more tense, it's not letting go. So keep your awareness there until you feel everything get loose. That is mindfulness with kindness. You're letting go. Let's check how your hands are. Make sure that they are at ease. Doesn't matter where they are, as long as they feel comfortable. Then go back up to your shoulders and your neck, making sure that your head is well balanced, not too far forward, not to the left or the right, so the neck is comfortable. And if, like me, you've got an irritation in the throat, you just know that irritation. You're aware of it, get to know it. And get to know what makes it worse, what makes it better. Mindfulness allows you to have some degree of control over your bodily workings. You can relax things. And then you go to your face, relaxing the muscles around the eyes and above the eyes on the forehead around the mouth. Because some of your emotions are manifested on your facial expressions. So relaxing those muscles around the eyes and the mouth have the effect of calming down some of the more disturbing of your emotions. I'm aware of the muscles around my eyes and I learn how to let go. So the muscles around my eyes relax to the max. And around my mouth it relaxes too. And once my body is relaxed, I look at it as one unit, my body, sitting here, relaxed to the max. I've done the best I possibly can to keep everything at ease. And there's a certain pleasure, delight, 
of a body which is relaxed. And I focus on that, get to know it, and enjoy it. Because I've noticed that as I am aware of the delight of a relaxed body, the relaxation goes to a deeper level. And I use this when I start to relax my mind. And once my body is relaxed, best I can. Then I go to my mind, my emotional world. And I look at what I've called the peaceometer. How peaceful am I right now? Or how agitated, restless am I? And I give it a number from 1 to 10. 1 is really relaxed and 10 is really agitated. How relaxed are you? How agitated are you? Once I know how where that needle of this peaceometer is, then I notice what causes that needle to go down. What is the the cause for me becoming more peaceful? What is the cause for me becoming more agitated? I realize when I let things be, my mind becomes more peaceful. When I plan, control, worry, then my mind becomes agitated. I'm learning the cause of peace of mind. And I keep creating the causes for my mind to become more and more peaceful, content and easily satisfied, not proud, not demanding in nature. And once I'm reasonably peaceful, then I can start observing my breathing. I invite my breath into my awareness. Am I breathing in? Am I breathing out? How do I know? And I'm aware not just of the breath, but how peaceful it is. And how joyful it is too. Because if my breath is not peaceful and joyful, I'll get sleepy. So we also watch our sleep orbiter. What causes you to get so dull? What causes you to be awake? So watch the breath. I'm going to be quiet now. When I start speaking again, 
you'll be close to the end of the meditation.
how, how are you feeling now? How peaceful is your mind? And how relaxed is your body? And what made the body peaceful? What made the mind at ease? To be content and easily satisfied allows you to be in this moment. Just to be here, this wonderful kindness, non-judging, non-measuring, just being. I'm now going to ring the gong to end the meditation. So now we're supposed to be continuing on with a, um, a, Dhamma, dis a Dhamma discussion. So with a Dhamma discussion, the meditation is a beautiful part of the, the practice of Buddhism because it allows you to come into the present moment just to be here. And in the present moment, sometimes we ask, what do we want? With kindness, it allows us, it's the cause of being in this present moment. And I will always remember uh, going to see one very famous monk in Thailand so many years ago. And I learned so much from this monk because I had a whole list of questions which I wanted to find the answer from. This monk was Ajahn Tate, who lived on the banks of the Mekong River in uh, just the Ampa Sri Chiang Mai in Nong Kai province. Oh, yes, right, Nong Kai province. And I remember him because when I first ordained as a monk, he was in the hospital diagnosed with incurable cancer under the um, sponsored every treatment possible by uh, King Rama the Ninth. And when the doctors told him there was no cure possible, he decided it's much better he dies in his own monastery than he dies in hospital. So he went back to his monastery in Makpeng about 20, 25 years later, he finally died. In other words, special monk defied all odds. But because he was a special monk, that I decided to go and visit and ask all these really deep questions on Dhamma. And I too had to wait in line until it was my turn. Waited a couple of days. And when it was my time, to actually to ask my questions. I went into his room and my mind went blank. All that effort, all that time, my mind went so peaceful that there was no questions left. There was such an acceptance, such a degree of kindness, you could actually feel it there, that I didn't need to be wise. 
I didn't need sort of it to be anything. It was a sense of total acceptance. He'd opened the door of his heart to me, totally. And so, what did I need to add? What did I need to improve? And it was a wonderful feeling of peace, where all questions found their answer. I don't know how many questions I've answered in my life as a monk, but you answer one question, there's always another question coming afterwards. But sometimes when you find and touch peace and kindness, it's so powerful, there's no questions left. So this is a wonderful experience, only through meditation, becoming so silent, so peaceful, all the questions vanish. The questions are like the waves on the surface of a lake. And those waves on the surface of the lake are created by the wind, the wind of wanting, the wind of thinking that you're missing something. When that wind stops, when that wind stops and there's no movement at all, over the surface of the lake. The lake becomes so still, so like a glass mirror, that it fully reflects and accurately reflects the image of the moon and the stars in the heavens above. You don't need any questions anymore. The reflection of truth comes from stillness, from peace. So that's why all the questions are fully answered in deep meditation. When the mind doesn't move, but it's perfectly alert. So, any questions? Yeah, there's one at the back there. Yeah. Oh, not really the back, but halfway, yeah. Thank you for the Italian gentleman yeah. who made a lovely pasta this morning. No, no, it's not. No questions. There's one thing which I haven't mentioned, is that sometimes people say, oh, well, you just fall asleep if you don't do anything. But sometimes if you do fall asleep in meditation, it's only because of what we call sleep deficit, because we're tired. And the brain automatically, whether you like it or not, you don't control it, it will actually make up. You know, the lost time when you haven't slept properly and you fall asleep. For years and years and years, I would fight my sloth and torpor when I was meditating. And I realized that the more I fought that sloth and torpor, the more tired I became. I was fighting it. I was using my energy, the little energy I had left, to try and fight these things out of negativity, also out of pride, thinking that I shouldn't be sleepy. But there came a time when realizing that wasn't working, so I decided just let myself be sleepy. There's nothing wrong with being sleepy. It's not against the precepts. As long as you don't, on purpose, when you're driving me to the next uh, function, please don't fall asleep. <laughs> but it's part of nature. But then, when I just allowed sleepiness to be, was kind to the sleepiness. I wasn't unconscious. There's a little bit of mindfulness left. And my mindfulness was making sure I never interfered with the process. I let it be. Because I let it be, I wasn't fighting. The mind slowly, not as fast as I would have liked, but it happened, it started to wake up. Wake up more and more and more. Because what was happening, instead of wasting my energy fighting, I preserved that energy. And it started building and building and building up 
until I became aware. Woke up was very clear, just letting things be, letting things grow naturally. And little by little, the mindfulness gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Could actually stay in this moment. And the breath was easy to watch. The only reason why people find it difficult to do something like breath meditation is because they start too early doing breath meditation. They don't establish the mindfulness and the energy, first of all. They force it. So because I learnt just to gradually let the mind wake up, let the mind be peaceful, let the energy come, when the breath came, which was just so easy to watch. Ah, breathing in. Ah, breathing out. And it became very pleasant. Just as I said in that meditation, as you relax your body, the body feels really relaxed. It feels good. It feels pleasurable. And sometimes people are afraid of pleasure especially in Buddhism, if you're enjoying it, you get attached. Stop that. But unfortunately, that's not how the Buddha taught. And so when my body gets really relaxed, it's so easy to let it go. And then when my mind started getting relaxed, it got so peaceful, it felt good. And the breath was very enjoyable. So enjoyable, it reminded me of one of my other heroes is still alive today, Ajahn Ganha. And those of you who may have seen him or visited him, when he spent a range retreats at Bodhinyana Monastery many years ago, that's in Perth, and I remember we asked him to teach meditation. And the only way he'd ever teach meditation was he would say, breathe in, sabah. Breathe out, sabah. And that was it. That was his complete meditation instructions. <laughs> How beautiful they were. Nice and concise, easy. Take it from there. Sometimes we talk so much about meditation. I do this because I have to follow the instructions. <laughs> I have to fill in another 20 minutes. But what does that mean, the word sabah? Nice and easy. How do you say that in Sinhalese? You know, so I mean, oh, it's, oh, this is really good. Whoa, yeah, this is nice. Sapai. It is sapai. See, we have a common language, the language of Dhamma. So, but you breathe in, it's really nice and easy and joyful and happy. And then you breathe out the same. Because it's joyful and happy, it's so easy to keep your attention on it. When I was first year as a monk, we used to meditate one day a week, stay up all night meditating. And sometimes, get to 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, I'd start getting sleepy. And I thought, oh, it's because we're meditating. I hang, hang on a bit, Ajahn Brahm. I'd only just become a monk. A year earlier, I used to go to all these all-night rock concerts and all-night parties. <laughs> you know, I never ever fell sleepy while listening to The Doors. <laughs> That's a rock band, by the way, in my generation. Because what was the difference? It wasn't the noise. It was I was enjoying it. My mind was engaging in the music or in the all-night party. But when I was meditating, I forgot to add the sabah, sabah. <laughs> as soon as you add the sabah to your meditation, so you're breathing in, oh, sabah. Because that's what I was doing when I was meditating a few minutes ago, because I shut up. So how sabah it is when you've got a sore throat, you don't have to give any talks. <laughs> oh, this was really sabah. My throat could take 10 minutes of rest. Whoa, yeah. So I was breathing in. Whoa, yeah. Breathing out. Whoa, that's good. <laughs> so that makes it very easy to watch your breath. 
And you keep doing that, and it actually does feel so peaceful. And that's the reason is because you really wake up. And as you wake up, you don't spend so much time thinking and planning and worrying and doing and criticizing and judging and all this other stuff, which takes up so much energy. When you cut all that out, then you start to accumulate energy. The energy builds. You wake up and then you really start to have happiness inside. Whatever you look at looks beautiful, looks gorgeous. To see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. That's one of my favorite stanzas from a poem by William Blake, 17th century English poet, an artist too. Brilliant stuff. What does that mean? To see a world in a grain of sand it means your mindfulness has grown so much. A grain of sand, so wow, look what's going on in there. To see a heaven in a wild flower. Wild flowers are just so small and many people just would walk over them and not notice them. And see beauty where you'd hardly ever expect it. Hold infinity, unbounded in the palm of your hand. Isn't that brilliant? So this is how we learn. When we wake up, we energize our mind. Meditation is easy. Sabai, sabai. And that's where we understand just how the peace and the stillness energize your mind and really give it some oomph and some power. Which is why you get happy when you're meditating. One of the happiest things you could ever do. Over in Indonesia, where I just came back from, they gave the introduction of my biography. They said that uh, they were asking me, and this was a talk a long time ago, and I said, my whole path in Buddhism is to become happier and happier and happier. <laughs> and that was a good marketing little uh, clip. <laughs> But it's also pretty accurate too. What would be the point of being a monk if it didn't lead to the fulfillment of deep, deep happiness and joy? Which then you can share with others. So this is a happy path into deep meditation. So when happiness starts to come up, cultivate it. Don't be afraid of it. Sabai. Oh, yeah. Sabah. Whoa. Sabah. Whoa, I can take more of this. And that is a path which leads to deep meditation. Okay, so any comments, complaints, or criticisms? No. Oh. So what's that? Okay, yes, we've got one. Thank you. In the busy life, you know, with, uh, when we sit down with the meditation, uh, it's all these things of the work or what to do and incomplete jobs and all that sort of things are coming, uh, flowing into the ma mind, you know, so disappearing into the thinking world, you know, a few seconds yeah. time. Well, I know what you're talking about because I live a very busy life. Hi. True. Thank yes. you. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I agree with you. And I've got so many projects. One of my projects I've got on. It's not just Newbury Buddhist Monastery. I don't know how I got myself talked into that one. <laughs> We're also building a nun's monastery in England, the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. We're also uh, now the uh, Dhammasara has got permission for their four new huts. They're building that. And it looks like we're going to get permission for six new huts in Bodhinyana Monastery, so I'm building that. And so we're also um, starting a new monastery in Albany, in the south of West Australia, so I'm building that. Uh, what else am I doing in my spare time? 
people keep asking me to do more translation of the suttas, which I'm doing that, and uh, giving talks and doing that. So it's a very busy life as a senior monk these days. <laughs> but yesterday we were giving out or selling some of the little books, I think Happy Every Day or something, and you see the first page there, what is being busy? It's doing too many things at the same time. One thing at a time. So when you're meditating, you just meditate. And everything else you can just put aside. So when I'm doing fundraising for the MBM project, which still needs a lot of money, according to, to, uh, to Adrian. So please remember, you can't take it with you. Don't be like that lawyer who puts <laughs> the suitcases above his bed. Uh, so when you're fundraising, you're fundraising. And when you're meditating, you're not fundraising, you're just meditating. I'm not giving a talk, I don't plan what I'm going to do next. And so, the unfinished business. That is answered by that monk who was building a big hall in his temple. And it came to the rains retreat, the three months when we're supposed to just meditate and do nothing else. It's a rest period. And I tell my monks, it is a rest period. The rest of you could have a nice easy time while I have to teach you all. But anyway, and give meditation instructions, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so what we do, what he did, the first day of the range retreat, he sent all the builders home. Come back in three months. And then the next couple of days, a visitor came to see his, his main hall. He said, oh, you're building a main hall. When's it going to be finished? And what was his answer? He says, it is finished. What do you mean it's finished? There's no roof on. There's no glass in the windows. There's wood and cement all over the place. Is this some sort of, some sort of artistic statement? <laughs> some Zen Cohen? <laughs> and then it's much better than a Zen Cohen because he said to the gentleman, what's done is finished. So he went off to meditate. So, when is it going to be done? When is Newby Buddhist Monastery going to be finished, Adrian? When it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so what's done is finished. Because otherwise, you know what happens? As soon as you raise money to pay off this one, then people think, oh yeah, great, we've done this one, let's do another one. Let's do the nuns' monastery, let's do the retreat center, and all this goes on and on and on. There we do that, we just don't worry about it. And don't make it the most important thing in the life. What's done is finished. It's a beautiful way of looking at life. And the heavenly beings, they will look after you. You don't need to worry at all. And I say that, I don't need to worry at all. Because I can always escape to Western Australia. I don't have to stay here and face the, <laughs> the police and the auditors. It all gets finished eventually. So in the meantime, what's done is finished. Which means that when you meditate, especially, what's done is finished and let everything go. So you can just be in this moment and enjoy the rest which you deserve. One of the stories I meant to introduce last night about self-love was the little poem which I wrote in the front of uh, opening the door of your heart. How to give yourself some self-love. It was a translation of a Chinese poem which I wrote down so many years ago. Grant yourself a moment of peace and learn how foolishly you've scurried around. The most important thing is grant yourself. You have to give yourself the moment of peace. Because it won't come to you unless you take it. Give it as a grant and a moment of peace. And you realize all this going around, unfinished business, this task, that task, and somebody else's task, you will find, unless you give yourself that peace, there'll be always jobs to be done. 
always work which is unfinished, which you have to complete. There's never any end unless you grant yourself a moment of peace. That's self-love. Not grind yourself peace forever, but grind yourself moments of peace. Time for yourself. Time when you can just be. When you do have those moments of peace for yourself, don't waste them discussing Dhamma, arguing, working, thinking. See if you can use that to actually to have real peace. Moments of solitude and contentment. And learn to be silent. And you've, you've noticed you've talked too much. And I'm a big hypocrite for mentioning that. <laughs> but that's my job. We do talk too much and it's not just with our mouth, it's in our head. We talk too much at life and listen too little to her, to nature. You listen to nature in silence. Just like a teacher at school or university, we have to just be peaceful, be silent inside, so we can actually hear what the teacher is talking about and learn. In this case, the teacher is nature, the teacher is life, it's Dhamma. We have to really be quiet to learn nature's secrets. And lastly, learn to be kind and you'll find your judgment of others, including yourself, was far too severe, far too harsh. Which is what kindness does. You give yourself kindness as a gift and then you find you judge yourself and others way too harshly so you can learn how to forgive. So one way of doing that, a little exercise you can take back with you, is if it's a birthday, <coughs> or like a Waysack day, or an important day of your life, give yourself a present. Get a little box with some wrapping paper, a little gift card and some ribbon and put something which you really, really need inside that box. And I'm not talking about money or gold or jewelry or something. Write on a little piece of paper, forgiveness. Put it in that box, wrap it up, nice ribbon and a nice little card and say to me, with love for me, with your name on it. And you can even post it, if you've got the money. <coughs> or just do it tonight and leave it just inside your front door. And in the morning when you wake up, you go and check the front door and, wow, I've got a present. <laughs> I wonder what it is. And you open it up slowly, and when you open it up, you see forgiveness. You've given yourself the gift of forgiveness, of kindness. All it does is make forgiveness, kindness, a little ceremony. And it makes it more important and more powerful. So you can give yourself that gift of forgiveness by writing on a piece of paper, a little packet. And do it properly, like you, you know, you're offering something you know, to uh, an important person. Expensive wrapping paper, nice ribbon, tie it up perfectly. And then when you open it, ah, isn't that sweet? How did I know that's what I really, really needed and wanted? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and that's the way you can do some self-love. And last but not least, when I did this, so some people have such a hard time loving themselves. And sometimes, the, you know, the people just, it depends on your culture. Sometimes in Western cultures, we don't like hugging. I don't like hugging when I've got, like, uh, 
a pony virus. So, and it's also because I'm a monk these days. And sometimes in the old days you could hug people, but these days it's sexual assault. <laughs> so I just be really careful. So what I do to actually to satisfy my hug deficit, you can also join in. You put your hands out. Come on, everybody. Hands out. And you bring them in. And in. And in. <laughs> when you give yourself a hug, number one, I can't sue myself for sexual assault. <laughs> number two, I don't catch anything I haven't already got. <laughs> and I don't feel so embarrassed. You're hugging yourself, giving yourself a gift of self-love. That's a wonderful thing to do. If ever you feel yucky, down, uh, sick, no one loves you. There's always one person who loves you in the world. Me. <laughs> okay. So, any questions after this? Great. So it's now three o'clock. So you want to sort of... Uh, <coughs> there is. One day, a quick question. I mean, like when we come... For retreat, go for retreats or come for day retreats like this, we, we get very peaceful, but then we take, go back to the real world and then it all dissipates. So how do we, how can we preserve it? So keep on coming here once a week. How many meditations do we have here a week? It's just like the, the Dhamma is like food for the heart. And the other food we take is, you know, food for the body. And Melbourne, of all places, got every type of food you could possibly want. You have lots of food for the body, but it's really hard to find a place where you can get a very, uh, very good... Um, you know you have these celebrity chefs. I think you might say that I'm a celebrity Dharma teacher <laughs> by all of the <laughs> photographs I get. So this you have a celebrity Dharma teacher. So one of the best restaurants for the mind in Melbourne. Wow. So lucky to get a seat at the table on Waysack Day. So, but it's always here for you. And so, if it's not actually here, just at the, um, at the Buddhist temple, we've always got like you know, the same as like that, uh, those Uber Eats, where you can ring out and it comes to you. <laughs> That's called YouTube. <laughs> so you can always get great teachings by many, many monks, good monks, good nuns. They're there. And don't forget the nuns. There's some very wise, great nuns, up-and-coming nuns. So the real world, you make that real world. So the world which you inhabit. So see if you can find more time to actually to listen to the Dhamma and to meditate. Join meditation groups. Even if you live a long way from East Morven, there may be another good temple close to, close to you. If still it's a long way away, then find some people who live in your area and just have a group together, you know, from sort of your, your sitting rooms, living rooms or whatever. So once a week you can actually go there and meditate together. Why not? When this Society of Victoria, when I first came here, there was in Richmond, in Mary Street. Remember those days? How big was Mary Street? temple was tiny yeah but that was just a few people coming together and meditating who knows where it can lead so that's what I challenge you to do so actually to find a great place where you can meditate put that into your main life that's an important part as important as eating Oh, thank you for that question. Of course you can, yeah. A group of friends. Get a group of friends who, um, you know, that uh, think similarly and just once a week, you know, have a nice uh, little meditation group there. There's heaps of resources these days. It means you don't have to travel <coughs> so far, which is uh, quite difficult, getting trams here and buses there. 
So I understand that, but this is where you can uh, solve the problem. Excellent. So I thank you for that. Really good question. Yeah. There you go. Sadhu. 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 Ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. Very good.